2 Kings chapter 18. We're in a quick three-week series called The Battle Belongs to the Lord. Last week we talked about King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. We walked our way through that text. We saw how a great enemy came against him and how did King Jehoshaphat respond? He didn't go to his military. He didn't go to the generals. What did he do? He went to the Lord. And the Lord said, stand still, hold your position, and you'll see the salvation of the Lord. And we saw God bring a great battle that day. And the Lord told King Jehoshaphat, the battle does not belong to you, but is the Lord's. Today I want to examine another war that another king faced. And this king was named King Hezekiah. And what I want to share with you again is that the battle is not yours. The battle is not mine, but the battle belongs to the Lord today. When you and I understand this principle, when it really gets into our soul, I mean when it really settles in on us and it sets in like cement and it fortifies, and it strengthens our faith, and we walk with God in a solid way, I'm telling you, you'll be able to handle, you'll be able to deal with any threat that Satan brings your way. You will not be like the wave of the sea that's tossed to and fro by the enemy. But no, you will be sustained. You will be strong. You will be strengthened. You'll be solid in the Lord. And isn't that what we want for our faith? We want to grow in our faith. Well, if you're going to take notes today, what this story is about found in 2 Kings 18 and 19, this is a story about intimidation. This is a story about the enemy coming against God's people and trying to overwhelm them, trying to frighten them, lying to them. Today, we're going to identify several lies that this enemy told Israel. And friends, I want you to know these lies come out of the pit of hell. And because these lies are from Satan, then I want you to know today this scripture is relevant to your life and my life because Satan uses the same playbook. He still tells the same lies to God's people. And if you and I can recognize them, then you and I can overcome them. Amen. So let's begin verse number 13 of chapter 18. We're going to try, by God's grace, to span two chapters. I'll have, it's like 70-some scriptures between the two. I'm going to do my best from memory to guide you through at least 17 of them. Now, you know I'm completely blind. I may not be able to, if I get a, a, a... A scripture a little off here or there. If I'm one under or one above, you'll forgive me, right? You just read the whole thing. It'd be good for you. And if I get a little off kilter, well, the Lord's going to help us, right? Verse 13, I want us to get the setting. We're introduced to what is one of the most fascinating kings of the Bible. His name was Hezekiah. And scripture tells us, that this enemy rose up against Hezekiah, against God's people, in the 14th year of his reign. Now, we can do a little math here. The Bible also tells us that King Hezekiah began his reign at age 25. So you add 14 years to it, we know he's 39 years old when he faces this great calamity. This is particularly special to me because I was 38 years old when I lost eyesight. And so Hezekiah is 39 years old, and he has to figure out how he's going to handle himself. He has to figure out what he's going to do concerning this great king of Assyria. And the Bible introduces us to the king of Assyria, and his name is Sennacherib. Sennacherib. Isn't that a fun name? Any of you ladies pregnant looking for a name? Maybe I... Actually, it's not a good name because let me tell you, his name means man of sin. So I would not name my kids Sennacherib. Not only would they not be able to spell their name by the third grade, they also, it's not a good name. 
Sennacherib came against Israel. Now, here's the problem with Sennacherib. He was a mighty man of war, and he had the track record to prove it. He conquered many lands, many empires. He overthrew many kings. So when Sennacherib breathes out his threat to the people of God, let me assure you, this is a serious threat. Sennacherib has the track record to back up everything he's saying. And so verse 15, if you'll look at that with me, King Hezekiah is in a problem here. Sennacherib is a strong Fortified enemy, and Sennacherib demands money from him. And do you know what Sennacherib demands? 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold. And the Bible says that Hezekiah emptied out the treasury of the Lord. And it even went so far as he stripped the gold off of the doorpost of the temple to give to this wicked king. Well, finally, Sennacherib, in his godliness says, this is enough. Let me tell you what's different about King Hezekiah. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to serve Sennacherib any longer. Let, let me tell you what the Bible says in verses 1 to 13 about King Hezekiah. It says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. It says that he held fast to God, that his trust was in the Lord. It says that he kept the commandments of God. King Hezekiah was a phenomenal king who walked with God, unlike many of his forefathers. And there came a point in time when King Hezekiah drew a line in the sand and he said, I am no longer going to serve this wicked king. I'm no longer going to be enslaved to what he says. I am going to draw a line in the sand and we're going to follow God. The Bible says he destroyed the idol worship of Israel. He even went so far. Check this out. Do you remember in the book of Exodus? Perhaps it was Numbers. When Moses was in the wilderness. Do you remember what Moses made for the people of Israel by the leading of God? He made the bronze cross with the serpent. And if Israel would look, they would live and they would survive the serpent venom. Well, Israel kept that all of these generations, all the way to the point of King Hezekiah. But see, Israel had a problem, and it's the same problem of humanity. You know, humanity is incurably religious. That's why there's so many religions throughout the world. Humanity is religious in nature. There is something in us that draws us to worship something bigger than ourselves. And you know what Israel did? Israel made an idol out of that cross. The Bible says that they offered incense to it. They offered offerings to it. They made an idol out of it. And do you know what this godly king Hezekiah did? He did the unthinkable. He broke it in pieces. Isn't that interesting? Can you imagine the fit people threw when he broke the cross that Moses himself made? And Hezekiah said, no, no, there's going to be no relics. There's going to be no false gods. There's going to be no idol worship in Israel. We're going to trust in the Lord. Let me tell you something, my friend. Say amen if you're with me right now. Satan will leave you alone if you're not serious about God. He won't mess in your life. But let me tell you, when you get serious about following the Lord Jesus Christ... That's when he's going to target you. That's when he's going to come against your family. That's when he's going to come against your marriage. That's when he's going to come against your job. That's when he's going to test your faith. When you get serious with the Lord. And Hezekiah shows up on the scene and he goes, no, we're going to cleanse the land. We're going to get rid of the fake. We're going to get rid of the idolatry. And we are going to follow God Almighty. And now he's going to face a battle like he could have never dreamed. Anybody ever been there before? Anybody ever been in a battle like you never dreamed could have happened? And this is where Hezekiah is. Verse 15, he gives the 300 talents of silver, the 30 talents of gold, and now he says, that's it. No more. We're not going to be enslaved. 
And now verse 17, Sennacherib, what a name, man of sin. He sends his emissaries. He sends three messengers along with an army. And let me tell you how big this army is. The next chapter tells us he sends an army of 185,000 warriors. Now get that image in your mind. An army of 185,000 men. Just to put a point of reference to it, Bristol Motor Speedway, just right down the road from us, seats 160,000 people. So add about 25,000 more to it. And that's the army that Israel faced. And these wicked men came against Israel. These emissaries came. And now I want you to note, if you'll follow along with me, let's note their lies. And remember, these are the same lies that Satan said that he tells us today. Lie number one, verses 19 and 20. Look what he says. On whom is your trust resting? God is not able to deliver you out of our hands. Don't be deceived. Don't be misled. God cannot help you. Let me tell you what this wicked man is saying to the people of God. He's saying, and let me tell you, this is Satan's first lie. He's saying God is not trustworthy. And you know, Satan will say the same to you. He'll say, what about your faith? What about your faith? God doesn't care about you. God's not paying attention to your life. God doesn't notice what's happening with you right now. God's busy with other things. You don't matter to the Lord. You're so small. You're so insignificant. God is not going to come through. No, my friend, his first great lie is God is not trustworthy. No, let me tell you what the Bible says, how trustworthy God truly is. The Bible says that the very hair of your head is numbered by the Lord. Amen? You know what that means? That means that God knows your life better than you know your life. I don't have any idea the number of the hairs in my head, but that tells me God knows me better than I know me. And if God is so intimately involved in my life that he knows the very hair upon my head, then guess what? He knows every circumstance. He knows every trial. He knows every fire. He knows every storm. He knows every sorrow. He knows everything I face in this life. He knows every bit of it. And he cares. The Bible says, cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. Amen. Amen. Don't let Satan tell you that God is not trustworthy. This was his first great lie. His second great lie. You talking about twisted. Oh, I hate the enemy. He twists truth. Rather than coming to them and saying, well, your God is false. There is no God of Israel. He doesn't say that. You know what he does? He takes the truth and he twists it. You know what that's called, friends? It's called wickedness. Wicked means twisted. Some of you got some furniture on your patio, and what's it called? Wicker. Why is it called wicker furniture? Because it's what? Twisted. The word wicked means to twist. And he doesn't come and say, well, your God isn't real or your God is false or your God is God, this or that. No. What a wicked man. You know what he says? But look at it. Verse 25. Moreover, God told me to come destroy you. Your God sent me to destroy you. Do you know, in essence, do you know what he's saying? God has turned his back on you. What a wicked lie. Can you see the level of deceit that the lies that are spewing out of this wicked man? He's saying God is not trustworthy. He's saying your faith is futile. It doesn't matter. God is not, uh, he's not worthy of your trust. And number two, he's saying God has abandoned you. God has turned his back on you. As a matter of fact, God sent me to destroy you. Friends, I don't know of a more twisted, of a more wicked statement in all the Bible than that right there. Let me tell you, every word that comes out of Satan's mouth is a lie. 
every one of them. For he's the father of lies, John 8, 44 and 45. The third lie, verse 30, he says, God is not able to deliver you. Has Satan ever told you that? That God's not able to turn your circumstance? Has Satan ever told you God's not able to intervene? God's not able to fix this? God can't do this? Oh, he'll lie to you, my friends. Verse 32. Watch this. You know what this wicked man says? This wicked man says, listen, you got a choice. You're either going to die or you're going to live and be my captives. And look what he says in verse 32. He says, it's better. It's better for you to be in bondage and live. He said, I'll come and take you to a land with honey and with wine and with grain. And he said, you will live and you will not die. Friends, do you know what he's saying? He's saying you would be better off to live in bondage under me than to face this war. Let me tell you, precious people, Satan will tell you the same thing. There's some of you today fighting addictions that Satan tells you. There is no use in trying to overcome it. I've got you right where I want you. You're never going to be set free. You'll never know what freedom is. And you might as well stay right where you are. He'll lie to you. He'll tell you you'll never break free. He'll tell you you're better off to settle and to live in bondage. But let me tell you what the Word of God says. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And listen to what it says. Do not submit again to a yoke of bondage. What a scripture. Friends, Christ has set you free. And we are not to yield ourselves. We are not to submit ourselves. We are not to settle for sin in our life. Can we say amen to that? We are not to settle for addictions. We are not to settle for sinful and harmful behaviors. We are not to settle with the enemy. We are to let God fight these battles. And what this wicked Sennacherib is saying is you would be better off to just make peace and settle. Let me tell you, you're taking notes. You need to write this down. Don't ever sign a peace treaty with Satan because it's not worth it. Do not settle. Do not sign a peace treaty with Satan. Because I promise you, it will not be worth it. And he'll try to tell you. God's not going to help you. God's not going to deliver you. God's not paying attention to you. God's going to let you fail. He'll tell you he's got you right where he wants you. No, my friend. So how do we handle the enemy? How do we handle such threats? How do we handle such attacks? Verse 36. Do you know what Israel did? The Bible says that the men of Judah were silent. And they did not answer him a word. Taking notes, write this down. Here's the principle. When Satan comes against you, have nothing to do with him. Jesus is our example. How did he handle Satan in the wilderness in Matthew 4? Did Jesus converse with Satan? Did he argue? Did he try to get logical? Did he get analytical? No. How did Jesus handle Satan? He spoke the word at him. And short of that, he never said another word to him. All he said is, it is written. And then he spoke the word. Praise God. Amen? Amen. And you don't need to argue with the enemy. You don't need to argue with other people. You don't need to analyze and you don't need to get all logical. And you don't need to figure out all the angles. You don't need to figure out the solution. No, do you know how you handle yourself? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I'll show you. Go to chapter 19. Did I make it through 18? Did I get all the scriptures right? All right, all right. If I get off, you throw something at me. <clears throat> I need a little shocker up here where if I get it wrong, it just shocks me a little, right? <laughs> With a metal podium, I guess that would work. <laughs> 
Say amen if you're with me right now. Amen. Now, so often, the worst news that we get in life so often comes in the form of a letter. And so often it comes from the enemy. King Hezekiah received this written letter from Sennacherib. I want you to note in your Bibles, chapter 19, verse 14. What did King Hezekiah do? Now watch this, my friends. Just like with King Jehoshaphat last week, there is no mention of the Israeli military. There is no mention of the military generals. There's no inventory of horses or chariots or swords or spears or shields. Do you know what King Hezekiah did? Look at it in your Bible. He took the letter and he spread it before the Lord. Fascinating. He didn't go to the politicians. He didn't go to the generals. He didn't go to the mighty men of war. Hezekiah went to God. And what do you do when you get threats from the enemy? My friends, you don't go to others. You don't argue with Satan. You don't try to find all the angles and solutions. No, my friends, you go to the Lord. And when you get it deep in your soul, the battle belongs to God. He will be the first one you go to and the only one you go to. And Hezekiah takes this to the Lord. He goes to the temple. He spreads the letters before the Lord. Let me tell you, you've gotten a bad letter. You've gotten a medical diagnosis. You've gotten a divorce decree. You've gotten a lawsuit. You've gotten a pink slip from your job and you're jobless right now. You've gotten a bankruptcy or a summons to court. Let me tell you what to do with that letter. Spread it before the Lord. Amen. Bring it before God. And watch how Hezekiah prays. People ask me from time to time. They say, Pastor Chad, how can I learn to pray? You know what the answer always is? Pray the prayers of the Bible. You'll learn how to pray when you pray Bible prayers. I tell you, last week, King Jehoshaphat's prayer. Jumping Jehoshaphat. It was incredible. And this week, look at King Hezekiah's prayer. Verse number 16. Oh, Lord, maker of heaven and earth, who rules over all kingdoms of the earth. You know what he's saying? He's saying, God, you're sovereign over all things. Sennacherib is big. Sennacherib is a problem. Sennacherib thinks he's in charge. But no, God, you're above Sennacherib. And you are the maker of heaven and earth. And you are above all kingdoms of the earth. You know what we do so often? We look at our problems and we magnify them to where they're the biggest thing in the world. No, you know what you do? Real prayer? Real prayer is you magnify Jesus Christ, who is the maker of all things. Amen? Amen. He made all things. He spoke all things in Colossians 1. And through him, all things hold together. You go to Jesus with it. He's above it all. Friends, the winds and waves still recognize his voice. Amen? And you go to God and you magnify God. And when you magnify God, then your problems are in the right perspective. Because God is above it all. The kingdoms. Listen. God reigns over them. And then look what he says. Incline your ear. Ooh. Incline your ear. That means to bend. Incline means to bend. Bend your ear toward me, God. Hear their threats. And look what he says. And open your eyes. See their threats, Lord God. And how they mock the living God. Friends, you know why I love this scripture so much? To ask the Lord to bend his ear and climb his ear. To ask the Lord to open his eyes and see. You know why I love it so much? Because you know what Peter wrote in his epistle? 
The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cries. Amen. Amen. You know what it is when you begin to pray and say, God, would you incline your ear toward me? Would you open your eyes toward me? Friends, it is a promise of the word of God. And when you pray that great prayer, you say, God, I know what your word says. Your eyes are on me and your ears are open to my cry. You are a strong tower. The righteous run in and are safe. Amen. Friends, that's how you pray. That's how you get ahead of your problems. That's how you get out in front of what Satan's trying to throw at you. You take it to God. And so he he prays. Incline your ear to me, verse 16. Open your eyes, see their mocks. The Bible says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. That's what it says in Galatians. And so verses 17 and 18. Now, I appreciate this. King Hezekiah says, God, there's some truth to what Sennacherib's saying here. Yeah, he, he's, not, he's not messing around. He's not, he's not blowing smoke, God. He really does lay nations to waste. Verse 18, he really does take gods and he throws idols into the fire and breaks them in pieces. And of course, Hezekiah says, of course, they're fake gods. They're not the living God. But you know what I appreciate that Hezekiah is doing right here? He's telling God the facts. You know, it's okay to be honest with God and to tell God the facts of what's going on. It's okay to tell God that you're afraid. It's okay to tell God that you don't know what to do. It's okay to tell God the mountain that's in your way. Be honest with the Lord. And say, God, I need your help like never before. And here's what's going on. I know Satan's lying, but God, here's the truth of the matter. I'm up against a wall, and I don't know what to do. Verse 18, verse 17, he tells God the matter, but look at verse 19. Look what he says. But, O Lord, our God, will you save us from the hand of the enemy, from the hand of the king, the hand of Sennacherib? O God, will you save us? Now say amen if you're with me right now. I want to teach you something out of God's word. Notice what he's... Notice what he does not say first. He does not say, oh God, will you save us because we are worthy of being saved. doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say, Lord God, will you save us because we deserve to be rescued. No, what does it say? Will you save us so that all kingdoms of the earth will know That you are God alone. Later on in this chapter, God says he is going to rescue them. And God says, for my name's sake, for my own sake, and for the sake of my servant David. Friends, let me tell you how to pray. You don't pray and ask the Lord for help because you're all that. (laughs) You don't pray and ask God for help because you're manipulating God. Well, God, I did this, so you need to do that. You don't pray and ask God to help and say, God, if you do this for me, then I'll do it. No, that's negotiating with God. As a matter of fact, in the next chapter, Hezekiah is going to negotiate with God, and it doesn't turn out well. You don't negotiate with God. No, do you know how you pray? You say, God, for your glory, for your own sake. So that everyone around me would know that you are God alone. Will you rescue me? Will you help me? Will you deliver me? Can we say amen to that? For God's own sake. For his own glory. Not for ours. But for his. I tell you what the Lord tells me many times. The Holy Spirit will remind me in this trial that I'm in. The Lord will remind me. Chad, if I am being so glorified in this blindness, I'll be even more glorified in its healing. Amen? And it's my prayer 
that everybody who knows me, who knows my story, everyone who will ever meet me will know that God is God alone. Amen. So, what verse am I in? Um, Oh, you're not following along, are you? You're letting me do all the work. (laughs) 19. (laughs) Verse 19. God save us. For what purpose? That all kingdoms of the earth will know that you are God alone. Friends, do you live your life in such a way that people see the lordship of Jesus in you? They see the glory of God in you? Whatever things you suffer, whatever trials you face, whatever fire you walk through, do they see Jesus in you? Live your life in a way that everyone who knows you, everybody that works with you, all of your neighbors, all your social media friends, whatever, that everybody who knows you will know that God is God alone. Verse 27, in verse, in verse 16, we see Hezekiah's prayer. In verse 27, <coughs> we see God's response. The prophet Isaiah tells Hezekiah, the Lord has heard your prayer and he's answered. And he tells Hezekiah that King Sennacherib is going to die by the sword. But I want you to look at what God says. <laughs> You know what God says about the enemy? Boy, didn't you enjoy that song, Raise a Hallelujah, this morning? Oh, raise a hallelujah. Amen. In the midst of my enemy, in the midst of the unbelief, in the midst of the mystery, my weapon is worship. Amen. Boy, I sang that with all my heart this morning. And look what God says about the enemy. God says in verse 27, I know his uprising and I know his downsettings. Let me tell you, God knows everything about our enemy. God knows what he's doing. God knows his next move. God knows what he's going to try to do. And let me tell you, God is well ahead of the curve. Nothing shocks the Lord. Nothing takes him by surprise. Verse 28, what does he say? God says, I am going to put a hook in his nose. Oh, don't you love that? How humiliating to the enemy. I'm going to put a hook in his nose and a bit in his mouth. Don't you dare tell me God's not sovereign. Don't you dare tell me God's powerless. See, they tried to say in chapter 18, God is not able to deliver you out of our hands. They're saying, no, God is powerless. God says, oh, no, no. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a hook in your nose. I'm going to put a bit in your mouth. And I'm going to turn you. And the same way you came is the same way you're going to go home. What a mighty word from the Lord. Amen? Amen. A hook in his nose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oof, and a bit in it. You're talking about embarrassing. You're talking about humiliating. And what did Jesus Christ do on the cross? Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. He humiliated. He stripped Satan and his kingdom. He stripped them. He humiliated them. He stripped them of all power. Amen? And may the Lord do it in our lives. Hallelujah. And so... God steps in. God says, no, this isn't going to stand. Verses 30 to 35 of chapter 19. Here's what God says. God says, I declare. Let me tell you, when God decrees a thing, when God declares a thing, you better know it's going to happen. Amen? You can take it to the bank. You can cash in on it. God will perform his word. God will do what he says he is going to do. And you know what he says is going to happen? Sennacherib is going to die by the sword. And God says, I declare he will not enter Jerusalem. God says, I'm going to fight for it. I'm going to defend it. And listen to what God says. Not one arrow will be shot from the bow toward Jerusalem. You know what God says? God says in the Bible, I think it's in Psalms, the Bible says, 
as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Do you realize you're surrounded by the Lord today? Do you realize God fights your battles on your behalf? That's why you can spread this disastrous news. That's why you can spread the calamity. You can spread the fearful news. You can spread it before the Lord. Verse number 35. <clears throat> this is where I'm going to close. You still with me? Say amen if you're still with me. In December, we're going to study angels. And you know, people really, they got the wrong view of angels. People, you know, culture shows us images of angels and half of us think we know what angels look like because of culture. And we think it's these cute, uh, puffy, uh, little baby looking things. Little angel dust just falls off their wings. (laughs) And they're so cute and cuddly. No, that's not the Bible view of an angel. We're going to learn in the month of December I'm going to try, I'll tell you everything I know about angels. Let me tell you what the Bible says. They are messengers of God Almighty. An angel is nothing to mess with. They are ministers of flame. The Bible says they have swords of fire. You remember what happened to King Herod in Acts chapter 12? When he glorified himself and didn't give glory to God, the Bible says that an angel of the Lord struck him down. Angels are nothing to mess with. And so, verse 35, God says, I declare it. This army's not going to stand. You're not going to pick on my kids. I'm doing the Chad translation right now. You're not going to pick on my kids. <laughs> Amen? God's people are not going to be bullied. God's people aren't going to be pushed around. God's people are not going to be threatened. God says, I'll step in. I'll intervene. And look at verse 35. That night, an angel of the Lord. We're talking one angel, church. An angel of the Lord struck down. 185,000 men in one night. Can you fathom that? In one night, the angel of God struck them down. And you know what? The battle was won before the battle ever began. Amen. Because the battle belongs to the Lord and not to you. And not to King Hezekiah, but to God. Let's close our eyes right now. Let's bow our heads. You say, Chad, what happened to Sennacherib? Oh, exactly what God said. When 185,000 men of his army were killed by the angel of the Lord, he tucked tail and ran home. And you know what happened? Verse 36, he went to Nineveh. God put a hook in his nose and a bit in his mouth and turned him back, sent him the same way he came. Verse 37, his sons came in while he was worshiping his false God and they killed him with the sword. They assassinated him. He was murdered. Friends, let me remind you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. May I remind you this morning, the same God that fought for his people, the remnant. The same God that dispatched his angel to strike down an entire army is the same God today that says he encamps his angels about all those who fear the Lord. Amen. Friends, you love the Lord Jesus Christ today. You're born again today. Let me tell you, on the authority of God's word, you have angels encamped about you. Mighty, warring angels. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is there to fear? 
when God is on your side. God is on your side today. Don't you listen to Satan's lies. Don't you let him tell you God's not trustworthy. Don't you let him tell you that God's turned his back on you. Don't you let him twist the truth in your life. Don't you let him tell you that God is not able or that God does not care. Let me tell you what to do. Don't answer him a word. Be silent today and go to God. Spread your trouble. Spread your problem before the Lord. And pray as Hezekiah prayed. Lord, incline your ear to me. Open your eyes to me. See the threats, Lord God. See how these people, see how this situation is trying to mock the Lord Jesus Christ. And may you intervene. May you fight my battles.